Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Amy. And I'm Hannah. And thanks for joining us for our latest episode. This episode features highlights from our recent Cicerone Live event all about hiking in Norway and Sweden. We were joined by two of our authors to talk about their experiences of hiking in Scandinavia. Uta Konning, the author of Hiking in Norway South, and Mike Lang, author of Trekking the Kungsleden. From choosing your hiking route and accommodation to advice about budgeting and river crossings, Uta and Mike shared a real wealth of knowledge with us. Uta Konig is a practiced world traveller and outdoor enthusiast and has lived in eight countries on four continents. She is the author of Cicerone's new guidebook to hiking in Norway South. Uta developed a love for the Norwegian outdoors while living in the country between 2009 and 2015 and has since returned every year for her work as a tour guide, as well as for further explorations and research. For more information, visit www.iventureout.com. Mike Lang is a freelance mountaineering instructor based in Snowdonia, North Wales. He is the author of Trekking the Kungsleden and an upcoming Cicerone guidebook to hiking in Northern Norway. He completed the Kungsleden as a through hike in 2017 and visited again twice in 2018 to complete and update his research for the guidebook. Mike is a full member of the Association of Mountaineering Instructors, the AMI, and operates his own business, Snowdonia Climbing. He has travelled, climbed and trekked extensively in Greenland, South America, Africa, Europe and the Himalaya. So we're recording this straight after our live event with Uta and Mike. So Hannah, I mean, it was a brilliant event, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a really good event. I'm I'm behind the scenes, but it kept me really busy trying to get through everybody's questions. There were tons of questions and it was a shame that we couldn't get through them all because some of them were really interesting and they really show that people are watching these events with real intention to actually go trekking which is quite exciting thinking that you are getting to directly ask our authors questions that are helping you with your plans to to go walking when we can Mike and Uta are incredibly experienced people but they're really happy to try and get everybody else to go and visit Scandinavia so I I think it is quite exciting for them to be involved in helping future treks happen. Uta and Mike both did some presentations for us, which you're going to hear the audio of, um, but they also showed us lots of amazing photos, um, which obviously you're not going to see on the podcast, um, but you can see those if you either watch some of the live event or if you get the guidebooks. And Uta and Mike both really want to inspire people to go. And I think are both itching to get out there as well. I think that really came across. Also, it seems like a very different trekking experience to, say, trekking in the Alps. And one of the things that we talked about was river crossings, um, which isn't really a feature on alpine treks in the same way. And I think that's really an exciting thing to think about is, you know, doing those river crossings on these Scandinavian treks. And also the hut system, I think, is quite different to a lot of alpine trekking. So, yeah, I think there's so much to offer in Scandinavia. I think exciting is a, is the right word as well, because it seems to me to be that you might start your trekking life by doing something in the Alps where you can be quite well looked after. You know, you can do the Tour of Mont Blanc and you can stay in beautiful hotels every night. Whereas maybe it's a bit of a progression that you once you've done a couple of treks, you sort of move up to Scandinavia level and you take on things that are a little bit more gnarly, like the river crossings, because they do look quite exciting. And that might put some people off that aren't quite ready for that. But other people, you know, they'll just be eager for the challenge that that offers. And I think what was really nice was I got the sense that, yes, you need to be able to read a map and navigate and look after yourself out on a trek. But it does also seem with the hut system and the transport and things like that. Mike talked about the Kungsleden and coming across two students and this was their first long hike. And it does seem that perhaps if you have the money to do it, someone nearer the start of their trekking or hiking adventures could do in quite a comfortable manner, you know, by using the hut systems. Those huts looked incredibly comfortable. There's a lot of good advice actually on Cicerone Extra about can you hike in Norway 
on a budget if you want a little bit more detail about some of those top tips that's worth a look and that's written by Uta as well isn't it and she's doing well depending on when this comes out and when the articles come out she's either doing or will have done some other articles about Norway as well giving some more top tips yeah and her blog iventureout.com as well has got tons of information on it and you know like we said before Mike and Uta are both really eager to share their experience and their enthusiasm for Scandinavia. So if you have got any more questions or, you know, there's something that we haven't picked up on, let us know. And it might be that we can ask them to write a little blog post about it or something like that. I'm sure there are other people asking the same questions as you. And I think maybe what some people don't realise is that the book being published is the end of a really long journey for these authors. Well, not the end, but they will have worked on the books for a minimum of three years before it gets published. So they've had this project that they've loved and nurtured and put time and energy into, and they haven't shared it with anybody. And then suddenly it's out there and they just want everybody to share the love for the, for their project, wherever that is. I think all our authors get really excited if you ask them anything about somewhere that they've written a book to, because they that's why they've written the guidebook. They are just incredibly passionate about those areas. Yeah, it, it, we're really lucky to have that out of our authors. So we started off our event with two brilliant presentations from our guests about the areas and routes covered in their guidebooks. First up is Uta introducing her new guidebook, Hiking in Norway South. Yeah, welcome to Norge, as Norwegians would say. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce you to Hiking in Norway South, the 10 best multi-day treks, the new Cicerone guidebook to hiking in Norway. It is very much a country that straddles two climatic zones. The Gulf Stream brings warm water along the along the coastline on the one hand side and then you have the continental climate coming in from Russia, Finland and Sweden on the other hand side and sometimes they do battle it out on the mountain tops so to speak. It is a very elongated country if you would pivot it on the south point you would almost get to Gibraltar so just to give you an idea also one of the reasons why you know we at Cicerone decided uh, to make two guidebooks out of it so to speak and I will be focusing on Norway south. The coastline is 25,000 kilometers long if you look at all the fjords. It is a very sparsely populated country, has about the size, you know, one third bigger than the UK, just for comparison purposes, but only 5 million people, and which means that there's really a lot of places to go where there's hardly anybody. Most people live around the coast in the big cities like Oslo, Bergen, Trondheim, and the country has a lot of national parks and only very little arable land, which leaves even more to discover on foot or on skis or on all kinds of in kayaks, cycling. It is known for the magnificent fjords and the fjells and alpine landscapes. It's a country that's been shaped by two and a half million years by the continuous ice ages and melts and so forth. So yeah, hiking in Norway south focuses, as said, on that bulb of the country, on the lower part. It's below the Arctic Circle. So here we do have very long summer days, but we do not have midnight sun. Nevertheless, it hardly gets dark at night in summer. So there's plenty of daylight hours to walk in. We focus the book on a number of national parks, Jotunheim and being internationally, if you like, the best known with, of course, the highest tops in Scandinavia being Galtöppingen and, and Glittertinden, with lots of glaciers, glacial lakes, moraines, scree, you name it. You know, you walk there and you see the Ice Age playing out all the time. Dovrefjell and Rondane are in the middle, in between Jotunheimen and Trollheimen, very different in their character, Rondane being really a mineral landscape, almost lunar, sometimes very barren. Dovrefjell, a high Felspiat plateau with um, Snöhetta, its highest peak outside of uh, outside of Jotunheim and still very much an alpine environment. And then up top Trollheim and the home of the trolls, a very much a Norwegian favorite with, with uh, mostly locals hiking in, in those fantastic landscapes. 
And, uh, you know, no guidebook really to southern Norway could be complete without having a fjord route. And that's what uh, route number 10, the Lusa Fjord route, is about, where you hike around the beautiful uh, fjord of light. Lusa Fjord means uh, fjord of light. Norway is this hiker's paradise for a number of reasons. You know, hard as said, very sparsely populated, mostly alpine environment, superb landscapes that are on many people's bucket list, and what I call an accessible remoteness. Accessible remoteness, that's what I call accessible wilderness in, in Norway. What is it about? So, you know, Norway is, is this beautiful, amazing country, but also with a population that loves the outdoors, that really has embraced the outdoors as their national identity. And that means that they put a lot of effort into that, that there are many associations, about, you know, 50 that together form an umbrella organization, the Norwegian Trekking Association. And they have marked about 20,000 kilometers of trails. They have the Norwegian Map Authority has great maps. So there's a great infrastructure for, for hikers to use. Of course, you need to you know, be able to read maps and, and find your way around. But in, in that sense, there's you know, many options that you would have. They also make it possible to access many of those entry points by public transport. And in fact, I made it one of my aims with this new guidebook to ensure that was the case, that you didn't uh, necessarily need a car to go, but that you could um, go and take buses and trains and, and just start your hike from there, sometimes with a little walk before, but not too much. And then there's a varied options in terms of accommodation and where to spend the night. The Norwegian Trekking Association, the DNT, runs about 550 mountain huts. And then you also have some private people that sometimes have run those these mountain lodges and huts in, you know, for quite a few generations. So the treks presented in the guidebook are in principle treks that take you from hut to hut, but camping is also very much a possibility because you do have the right to roam in Norway and that means that you can go wild camping. There are some responsibilities and of course some rules attached to that, but it is very much possible. So you really have here different options that, you know, in, in the sense you can have the holiday that, that you want. You can either go light with, with a backpack that is not so heavy and go hut to hut, or you can choose a more adventurous approach and do the wild camping, which means you, you do take a little bit more luggage with you, obviously. And so what is it that you can choose from here in hiking in Norway South? Just as, you know, a very broad overview, they are between three and eight days long. Some of them have extensions and then they are between 41 and 152 kilometers long. And the different stages on every day you can expect to walk are between 10 and 24 kilometers. And the aim was to have really a wide range and diverse range of, of hikes. So, you know, there's very many possibilities to, to go to different areas and, and just take a shorter trek there. Or you can really literally almost hike for a whole month and do the whole book in one very long summer, so to speak. Each you know, the book is organized very much like every Cicerone guidebook where there's an introduction to Norway and then each region is introduced and the highlights given. So, you know, that all together should give you very much an opportunity to devise the hiking holiday that, you know, is very much your own, that adjusts to your needs and wishes, to the time frame that you have and the experience. And next up, here is Mike introducing his guidebook to trekking the Kungsleden. Now, unfortunately, we did experience some sound issues from this point forward in the event. I've done my best to edit the worst of it, and there's so much brilliant content from both Mike and Uta coming up. I didn't want to cut too much of it out due to sound issues, um, but apologies if it is too distracting. Over to Mike and the Kungsleden. Okay, so the Kungsleden, or the King's Trail, is 460 kilometre long trail in northern Sweden. It's an end-to-end -end trail, so it's a different beast to a multitude of trails that Oots mentioned. And half of it is north of the Arctic Circle, so what you can expect if you go in the middle of the summer is 24 hours daylight and the excitement that brings. If you go at the other end of the season, say if you go right at the beginning of the season or the end of the season, you may be able to see some of the aurora borealis. So there are extremes in this part of the world when you're up near the Arctic. 
The trail is split into five sections and it was conceived the trail in the early 20th century and it's grown in a southerly direction to its current terminus in Hemavan. The trail is split up into five sections from Abisko in the north down to Vakatavare and then it picks up again at Salta Luokta and the second section goes down to Kvikyok and then the third section heads down to Yakvik, fourth section down to Amanes and the final section down to Hemavan. And you will go through a variety of landscape. The first section and the final section are the most mountainous and the least forested. And then the central three sections really are more forest, rolling vale, open fell and lakes. But lakes and rivers are found across the entire Kungsleden. And you're going to experience superb landscape and vast open skies. The trail is very user-friendly. It's well provisioned and materially it's looked after by the local counties, Norbotten in the northern half of the trail and Vastabotten down in the south. So wherever it, whenever it's boggy or anything, they've put a small bridge in, a log bridge. If it's a bigger river, there's a steel bridge. Or if it's just boggy ground, they put these boardwalks down. And if you're eagle-eyed, when you're walking along, you will see lemmings every now and then scurrying under the boardwalk. There's a lot of variety in colour coming from different angles on the Kungsladen. The first section, second section and the most otherly section are all provisioned with hut and these are manned and provide a good level of service. And these are manned by Stugvards, hut wardens, the STF, which is the Svenska Turistföreningen, which is the Swedish Tourist Association. And they provide the huts on the three sections. Another element of colour on the Kungsladen are the boats. And there are seven mandatory boat crossings to be made if you're going to do the whole trail. And the STF provide boat rowing boats on four of these crossings. And other places they provide motorboats. And sometimes you get private operators providing boats as well. The huts themselves, we'll probably talk more about that, but you can provision here, you can sleep there, you can have a bastu, which is a sauna, and it's a great way to soothe your walking muscles at the end of the day. I'll confess that I'd never been to Sweden before I went to research this guidebook, and I was just gobsmacked the whole way, and it was such an adventure. The landscapes, the community feeling in the huts, and because of the people you met on the way, I I thought the Swedes were so engaging, so funny, And I just had such a great time. So I was really surprised. I went there for the trekking experience and to enjoy the landscape. But actually, I was really taken aback by the human side to the Kungsladen, the community spirit. And yeah, I I, I think that was one of the great joys of the Kungsladen. And I think that's probably an enduring feature that whenever you go, you will meet like-minded people who want to share their experiences. And they were such funny people as well. So there's a variety of people here. These two guys were a couple of university students. They had hardly done any trekking before in their life. They were students from Stockholm and they were stopped halfway through the day and these guys were cooking pancakes for their lunch so they invited me to stop and have pancakes with them and yeah it was just those little experiences make it really special. After our two presentations I followed up with some of my own questions and then questions from our live audience. My first question was to Mike, say you only have a week, which section of the Kungsleden would you recommend? Okay I've got a map because I was anticipating (laughs) So that's the whole Kungsleden, yeah. um, starting north in Abisko and down to Hemavan. And I would say to people, if you've never been here before and you've got limited time, go and do the northern section. So if you're going to do the whole trail, you would go Abisko down to Vaka Tavare, get the bus and pick up at Salta Luotka. But you could also, and there's an alternative itinerary in the guide, at Singi, you can turn east and you can go via Kebna Keza Fial Station out to Nikola Wachter. And that allows you, it's, it's a very easy journey to make. You can do this in a week. You can fly to Sweden and fly up to Karuna, get the train to Abisko, walk the circuit, get the bus out from Nikola Wachter back to Karuna and catch a flight again. So it's very convenient in terms of that delivery. The mountain landscape is amazing and you get into the mountains quite early and also it's well provisioned with huts. So if you want to go lightweight, you know, you hardly have to take anything. You can get bed in the huts, you can get food in the hut, and you can go super lightweight. You can just camp between the huts and take the best of what the huts have to offer in terms of stopping off, getting rid of litter and rubbish, etc. But yeah, this is what I would recommend, the northern section, either through to Vakavatare or even more conveniently, do the loop to Nikola Wakta. And that can be done either direction. 
If you're interested in discovering Norway and Sweden for yourself, please head over to the Cicerone website where you can get a 25% discount off both guidebooks. Type in Nordic25 with a capital N at the checkout. We hope you enjoy reading the guidebooks and discovering Norway and Sweden for yourself. You've both mentioned the huts and touched on accommodation. I've never been hiking in Norway or Sweden, but I have been trekking in the Alps. So I wondered how these compare, you know, huts in these places compare to, say, huts in the Alps and what sort of facilities they provide. So it's the DNT huts in Norway and then Sweden, it's the STF huts. Yeah, to some extent, they seem similar to the ones in Sweden, only in Norway, you have, in fact, three different types of huts. Some of them are uh, almost run like lodges, particularly sort of in, in the high, in the summer season. So there you get all food. So you come in after your hike in the afternoon and there will be dinner served and you can get a breakfast and then make yourself a lunch to take on the next day or for the, for the trail. You do hut to hut and then in the next hut it's a bit like that too. Then there is huts that are where you self-provision and self-cook. So they have a little pantry with things that you can take out. You know, your spaghetti and tomato sauce, pancake mix, milk, sugar, tea, you know, all kinds of canned fruits and vegetables. And you, it's an honesty system. You take things out, you either on an app or on paper, you mark what you've taken and you're then charged on your card later on. Those are called self-catering huts. They also have uh, in, in the sleeping room, so to say, which are communal most of the time, you will find pillows and quilts. So you are required always also in the lodges to bring your own sleeping liner or sleeping bag for hygiene reasons. But other than that, it's like what Mike was saying, you know, it allows you to go lightweight with these huts. And then there's huts as well, where and you'll find those in northern uh, Norway, probably might more, where it's, it's unserviced. So you do have all the cooking utensils that you need. You have, again, the quilts and, and pillows in the huts, but there's no pantry. So here it means that you are welcome to use, you know, you write yourself in and everything, and but you do need to bring your own food for those. And in southern Norway, on the treks presented, there's a few of those, but not too many. It's more of a mix. In southern Norway, you often have the most likely the, the self-service where you have the pantry or the lodges. These Some of the lodges will close after the high summer season, and then they will run a self-service one. So you then uh, go to the pantry, and then you're allowed to make yourself a meal there. You're not obliged to actually buy the full board option. Many of these huts will require you to have the universal key. And so in that sense, it's already a good idea to become a member because only as a member you can order and pick up you know, the key for these huts. Not all of them, but yeah, again, either in your research or you know, in the book, you would find which of these huts require a key. So that's the situation in, in Norway. When you have the, the huts that are run privately, they always run like lodges. They will close at the end of the summer. And as a DNT member, you will generally get a discount on their fees there. So they offer between a 5 and 10% discount on the accommodation and, and the board. So the lodges, you can choose a little bit as to what the pricing is. Uh, if you want a smaller room with fewer people, then that will generally be more expensive. If you're happy to sleep in a wider with more people, then that's uh, generally a more economic option. So yeah, so that's from Norway. And I'll give to Mike to describe the Swedish situation, so to say. Yeah, so the comes later. But to recap, I said the first, the second and the fifth sections of the trail are fully furnished with STF huts and they have stugvads and it can be quite pricey to stay here so if you are going to avail yourself of the huts I would highly recommend you join the STF before you head out because you get discounts on staying at the huts or camping at the huts so on one extreme you can have full fat which means you turn up with virtually nothing. So unlike Alpine huts, they don't cook food for you here. You can only buy and prepare it yourself, but there is a kitchen. So if you were to stay at a hut and buy the food at the hut, i.e. something for dinner that day, something to do for breakfast and something as a packed lunch on the trail, and you paid to stay in the hut, you're, you're looking north of £50, £50 plus for that. And over, say, 10 days, that's going to add up 
The other alternative is you can camp inside a hut and buy the food there. That obviously makes it a lot cheaper. Or you could be carrying your own food and you get to camp by the hut and you, you'll pay a minimal fee and that will give you access to the sauna. Or even lighter still, if you remember the SDF, you could just pass through the hut in the middle of the day. You're allowed day visitor rights as a member, so you don't pay, but you can use the kitchen there, get rid of your rubbish, use the sh shop, all those sort of things. What I did a few times was I camped, but not by the hut, so I didn't pay. And I just came in the evening and paid a minimal fee for the sauna. At the end and beginning of sections, you have fial stations, and these are much larger. So these are booked through the SDF website. And for a fial station, it's more like a hotel. So you are booking a bed on a particular date and you've got to turn up on that date. It's not very flexible. There's high demand. Out on the trail, a fial stuga, when you book, you specify a date, but you're really just buying a voucher. So if you were to turn up a week early or a week later than the date you'd booked, they would still let you in. They claim that they never turn anyone away. So when all the bunks are filled, they just got extra mattresses and they put them down on the floor. So there's flexibility built in, even if you're booking into a Fial Stuga, it's more a voucher than tying you down to a particular date. And there's water always at the huts. Nearly every hut has a shop. Uh, so that's a quick run through the huts, really, in, certainly in Sweden on the Kungsleden. That's brilliant. We've got a question following up on booking, asking how far in advance should huts be booked? Yes. So I explained that out on the trail between the section ends at the Fjallstuga, you're basically buying a voucher. So there's complete flexibility. You could buy it a month in advance. It's basically a voucher. They, they won't tie you down. The Stugvards will not say, oh, you're here three days early. So you could buy it well in advance. You're buying a voucher, really. But for the Fial stations, it's like a hotel. So that's really down to personal choice, really. Once you know you're going, I'd get in there early. But they do have large capacities. We're talking, you know, I think Kevna has something like 120 bed spaces, maybe more. And is that the same in... Uh, Norway, Ita? Norway is a little bit different. These days you can now uh, book in advance. You can book a certain bed in a cabin and you then have the right to that bed until seven o'clock in the evening. But there's also flexibility. They will never turn you away, but you can book them in advance. And I would say for for maybe the bigger huts where you know capacity, you know, 50 beds and upwards where they are at the start of the trail. If you know you're going and if you know you're going to be there that day, then by all means make a booking and you can do that. But you will actually never really be turned away in, in Norway. You know, there's always space for more people. The lodges in Jotunheim and where you have more international travelers there. I would say if you know you're coming and you know you've made your route, by all means do book. But it's not compulsory and you're not, it's a little bit different to Iceland. I've been to Iceland. There's more capacity, let's say it like that, you know, in, in Norway than there would be in Iceland, really. There's, you know, the huts in Iceland are very different. In Norway, with the bunk beds and the kitchens, it's a little bit more spacious. After talking about huts, I asked Uta and Mike for their top tips on budgeting in Norway and Sweden. And if you'd like to find out more, head on over to the Cicerone website to check out Uta's brilliant article all about hiking in Norway on a budget. If you want to go lowest budget, I would say do take your tent. And, and so then, you know, you have maximum flexibility. You can go shopping at the entry points when you go. It also means you need more luggage and carrying more kilos. What Mike said, you can use the best of the huts. You can even, you know, maybe bivy or use the tent, use the facilities when you really need them. It's rained all day and desperately need the drying room and you want a warm bed that night, then, you know, you treat yourself to that and going, choosing a route where you can stay in the self-serviced or unserviced huts. Choose a route that is like that. You can cater for yourself more and that becomes less expensive. Brilliant. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Mike? Yes, but I'd mainly echo Uta's point there about the tent. Sleeping in the Fjallstuga is the main expense. If you took a tent, you're also, you're getting lots of other things by taking a tent, which is flexibility. So, you know, if you are wholly reliant on the huts you are wholly dependent on getting to that hut every day so i think if you carry a tent you can still make use you could still buy your food in the hut and then you're not carrying the weight of the food every day either so you're just carrying a tent but making it much cheaper and i suppose out on the trail you know you never know when the weather's going to turn really bad 
and you might have another 10 kilometers to the hut. If you've got a tent and a sleeping bag, you can just pitch your tent. If say if you're a complete novice going to this semi-remote area, you know, you may have to go hut to hut and you might not want to carry the weight. And then, so you're not really sidestepping the cost. But if you could take a tent, that would be the main thing. And you can camp at the hut and get all the other benefits, including the bastu, the sauna. Yeah, that's a little different in Norway. If you're not wild camping, if you're near the hut, you do need to pay a little bit uh, in Norway for that. But I would say, same as Mike, it's a different adventure, a different experience. You know, one is the lightweight and, you know, having a safety net. The other one with the tent is million dollar views every day by yourself yeah. and anywhere where there's nobody there. Both have their charm in the the community that you have in the huts is also just absolutely lovely. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. very special. You know, it's very different experiences. So, and I think, you know, that's also something I say to people when they talk about the budget. Scandinavia is expensive, but you get something that is very special that you don't get anywhere else. And so maybe it's worth just saving a little bit more up for it and then enjoying that to the fullest. Yeah, I think that's an absolutely lovely sentiment. Brilliant. We've got another question about when is the best time to go to avoid mosquitoes? And actually, maybe we should start by saying when is the hiking season in Scandinavia? Yeah, so in, in Rufulke, so around the Lusefjord, it starts there early July. But in general, many of the hiking trails have uh, bridges. And so uh, you have to wait until the season starts and the bridges over some of these rivers have been put in. So really the hiking season, uh, Jotunheim and above is mid-July until mid-September. And really, I, I can count the days when, in, you know, in all the 10 years I've been hiking there where mosquitoes bothered me. I don't know. I you know, there's two days, maybe. I don't know. It's, I think maybe, you know, to, towards the east, towards Röros, there might be more when you are more in the forested areas. But again, most of the time, you're also in, in my guidebook, you would be above uh, the tree line. And so there is, there's not many mosquitoes. What I would say is the main pest you need to be aware of are the ticks. And I would always say, take a tick remover with you and know how to use it. Again, I've used it twice in 10 years, but it's important to, to take, you know, any tick out immediately. So, and otherwise it's, you know, the occasional other, you know, snake that you will see. But other than that, mos mosquitoes haven't bothered me there uh, at all in, in these areas. So can't really say much about that. And I, I do know they can be, I've hiked Scotland and so, <laughs> <laughs> well, they are not mid they're midges. So yeah, no comparison. It's very rare that it's totally wind still anyway. So, yeah, can't say that ever was an issue for me in southern Norway. And what about the hiking season in Sweden? So the summer season really is, is allied with when the STF huts open. And that's uh, mid-June till the towards third, fourth week in September. So the STF will open their huts at that time. And possibly more importantly, that's when they put the STF boats in on the water crossings so it's not really viable as a route outside those unless you go and do it as a winter route of course there's a whole separate winter season my guidebook's a summer one so that is the main season and the best time to avoid the insects would be at the very beginning of that season or at the very end when the temperatures are colder because that's what they can't survive they need it to be warm but it's not just about timing in terms of the season it's about what you do and where you you decide to sleep so not to sleep within the tree line or near still water. I've been there what's supposed to be the peak of the insect season and I wasn't bothered much, but I did have a couple of nights where it was hell. So one of those was at Beverhomen, which is a beautiful place. And I stopped there because the Vard House did cooked food. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll camp here tonight. But it was near flat water and it was hellish. So when I was in my tent, I wanted to make a, a cup of coffee. I basically had my hand, I was in the inner tent, and I had my hands sticking out the bottom of the, the mesh screen on the door, making the coffee on the other side, because, I mean, they were vicious. So when, when they hit you bad, they hit you bad. It's really interesting that, that you've both had quite differing experiences. Yeah. Another question. Oh, what are the costs for the boat crossings? Oh, that ve varies that hugely. Vary? Yeah, and I, I would probably have to look at, in my guide for that. <laughs> so the most expensive crossing is one where... 
there is no STF provision. So the crossing of the Ribness on the final day into Yakvik, and there is only a private service there. And it's a long crossing as well. And you're better off ringing a couple of days in advance. And my guidebook says where you can just catch a signal to ring ahead um, with the Johansons who run that service. So that will be about £45 now, that crossing. So that's the top end. So that's quite pricey. And sometimes you have to wait a long time there because he, he also does clienting and hunting for other people. So he's not always there to take you across. That's why you should ring in advance. So you can either speed up or slow down. So you're not spending too much time at Vuanatican, which is where the boat leaves from. The STF card will give you discount on crossings where there are STF motorized services in place. The rowing boats are free, obviously, but it, it would not only discount the huts, it discounts the STF motorized services where they are. Brilliant. Thank you. So I think we're going to have to kind of wrap up, but I wanted to ask you a final question each. So Uta, you return to Norway every year when you can for hiking, but what is it about Norway that you love and keep going back to? First of all, my work, I love being a, a guide there. And if I get the chance, you know, I'll be there again next year. And then there's so many things, really, Amy, the light there, the f- the sense of freedom, you know, with having that right of access, you can make the adventure that you want. You, you can have it with a safety net or you can try it out and be self-reliant. When you go out, it's remote. I mean, the huts might have all the comforts you need, but in between you're by yourself. And so, and there will not be a lunch spot or a pub or anything uh, like that. So I think that makes it very different to, you know, other hiking areas where you have culture uh, and heritage around it here it's really you and nature and you and the elements and you yeah and you can make it as exciting and exhilarating and adrenaline full as you like and so you know that's been part of my journey where Norway has really made me more intrepid with every year and I've tried new things and there's always more and and so it just pulls me back. Thank you thank you so much and Mike, we've obviously been talking about the Kungsleden and Sweden, but you are gearing up to write the book to hiking in northern Norway, you know, when we can travel again. What are you most looking forward to when you can get out there? It's probably going to be the first long distance trekking I'm doing post-COVID. So that in itself is just uh, so exciting. Sweden's a fantastic country, fantastic people. But when I was in Sweden, everyone's going, oh, you must go to Norway. So I'm expecting great things of Norway. So I'm doing the top half. I'm looking forward to going to the Lofoten Islands, which will be fantastic, and doing the Finnmarks Vida up in the north. That looks like a very special area. And I think there's probably going to be vast vistas there. And that feeling of remoteness is probably most acute up there, I think. I don't know if you've been there, Uta. Not yet. Not yet. It's famous for ranger movements in winter herding. Exactly. But the Finnmarks Vida... Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think the Finnmark feed is going to be the highlight mm. for me. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, it sounds absolutely amazing. And I think this event has just made me so desperate to go and just, mm. you know, partly just to get out and go somewhere because we're all not able to do that at the moment. But yeah, it has just been so inspiring. So yeah, thank you both so much for joining no, me. You're this welcome. Evening. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Amy. That was Uta Konings and Mike Lang talking about hiking in Norway and Sweden. Thanks to them for joining us for our live event and sharing their expertise and enthusiasm with us. And thank you for listening to this latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. Let us know what you think by leaving reviews on your podcast platform or by emailing us at live at cicerone.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Visit www.cicerone.co.uk to find over a thousand articles, sign up to our newsletter or buy one of our guidebooks. You can subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or on your favourite podcast provider. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, search for Cicerone Press on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And you can also join our Facebook community, Cicerone Connect, to connect with other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.